Welcome back. This is the second half of the RHEL Roadmap presentation. We're going to be talking a lot about the features that are going to be showing up in RHEL 7 out real soon now. In this session, we're um, going to be looking more at some of the user space and virtualization features. And we've got um, probably, as always, we'll run out of time for questions. So there is an ask a question button on your Summit app. And we're going to use that, again, to collect questions. And we'll get answers back. Um, we'll be sending mail out to people's usernames. Okay, so I'm going to turn this over right now to Andre Vashik, who's going to talk about software collections and core utilities. There you go. Hello, can you hear me? OK. Hello, my name is Andre Vashik, and I'm manager in developer experience team. Uh, we maintain and develop a majority of command line interface uh, utilities and uh, services. That's quite a lot of stuff, so I will focus only on highlights, not covering on all new features and enhancements in this field. Um, let's move to the software collection. This is the first item I would like to highlight. Um, this is a relatively new um, package delivery method, um, which makes you able to install and use multiple versions of uh, some applications in parallel. Uh, this uh, way, you can keep the enterprise um, version of the uh, application to run the legacy scripts or applications and use the modern stable one uh, from the software collections uh, for using and development of modern applications. Uh, Red Hat pro provides two products uh, based on the uh, software collection technology. Uh, first of them is developer toolset, um, which uh, brings you uh, the new uh, developer and debugging tools, uh, primarily for C and C++, and it will be covered in more details by Matt. Uh, and the second one is RHSCL, uh, which uh, contains uh, primarily the dynamic languages, web servers, and databases. Um, with uh, the RHSCL, you can have the same version of the Apache or Perl or Ruby uh, on your system on RHEL 6 and RHEL 7. And this may uh, help you uh, with the migration to the RHEL 7 as you can adapt uh, on RHEL 6 uh, to this very critical stuff. Uh, next item on my list is Apache, uh, the web server. Uh, in both uh, RHSCL 1.1 and RHEL 7, it will come with version 2.4. Um, and um, it. Um, gives you a better scalability and memory use reductions thanks to threaded even processing model. And um, other uh, important feature there is um, in authorization modules. Uh, authorization modules were completely redesigned to give you the power uh, to write more complex policies and uh, it makes uh, the Apache web server even more robust. Uh, proxy modules were um, were optimized and improved uh, in focus uh, on the cloud environments. Next uh, item on my list uh, is databases. Um, last year we had a discussion on the summit if we will have MariaDB uh, or MySQL in RHEL 7. Well, thanks to the software collections, we have both. Uh, MariaDB is uh, the primary database um, um, in RHEL 7, it's RHEL 7 default. Uh, it comes with version 5.5. And since the switch in Fedora 19, uh, it proved to be fully compatible with MySQL 5.5. In addition uh, to the MySQL 5.5 features, it brings you asynchronous client APR and more storage engines. Another uh, database uh, very popular among users is Postgres. Um, it comes with version 9.2, and it <laughs> makes its first steps to an OSQL type of the database. Uh, from the features, I would like to highlight the synchronous uh, replication, and uh, there is a migration uh, script which uh, can convert uh, your database from the older, or, or database and setups, from the older version to the 9.2. So it makes the migration even easier. And of course, there, is, there are performance improvements. 
Next item, core demons. Uh, T&D was partially covered by, uh, by Linda uh, in kernel. Uh, T&D, the, the power management demon, uh, comes with uh, automatic uh, profile generation um, based on, uh, with, in cooperation with uh, Tuna or PowerTop. And it comes already with some product-specific uh, profiles. Uh, other uh, daemon I'm going to mention is DNS mask. This is small-scale um, DNS forwarder and DHCP server used by LiveVirt and OpenStack. Um, and it, uh, like, uh, it lacked the support for DHCPv6, which was one of the primary blockers for IPv6 support in these products. Uh, the support was added, so um, IPv6 is now more real. Uh, ISC uh, daemon, uh, DHCP 4.2, um, as in many cases, there are performance improvements uh, um, based on dynamic DNS uh, trans um, transactions, uh, which are asynchronously run. Um, and um, DAVCode uh, 2.2, the mail server, um, comes with uh, mailbox synchronization utility and um, multiple IMAP extensions. Next item, core utilities and shells. Um, YAM, uh, the popular upgrade, uh, uh, package upgrade uh, manager, um, comes with repo packages command, uh, which allows you to treat repositories as products. This way you can update uh, or remove only part of your system. Um, second item, core utils. This is uh, the set of more than 100, 100 uh, core and more, most fundamental utilities on the command line. Most of the users think that the development there is over. Well, it's not, because you still have to support the new technologies and you, ha you need to optimize uh, the code, um, which happens uh, in GNULIP modules and the core utils itself. Here's some utilities. Um, now you slip crypto from OpenSSL, uh, which makes some of them uh, twice faster. SE Linux support was uh, added in core utils in RHEL 5, uh, but it was as downstream patch. And uh, in RHEL 7, um, the support was unified uh, across the utilities, so uh, users can expect um, better comfort when using the options. And these two are just a subset of many, many uh, possible um, utilities we maintain. Uh, developer experience maintains about more than 40% of the packages in RHEL 7. So I really recommend you to try the RHEL 7 beta to learn more about the new features, new enhancements uh, in, in uh, this field. Next item is pre-upgrade assistant. Uh, In-place upgrades uh, were always a feature which was missed in uh, RHEL 7, uh, in Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And uh, pre-upgrade assistant is a critical part of the in-place upgrades. It does the system assessment uh, and provides admin uh, the instructions how to mitigate the possible uh, migration issues or in-place upgrade issues. Uh, as the pre-upgrade assistant uh, is based on OpenScape and uh, mm, it just stores the logs, it doesn't modify the system, it is safe to use even if you don't plan the in-place upgrade and you are only going to do the migration. Uh, you can use the instructions for that. It is still work in progress, um, and thanks to modular design, uh, we expect uh, more and more modules will come later on, uh, even after the RHEL 7 GA. Uh, on the next slide, you can see the structure of the report. There is a tree structure. Uh, you can see the networking part. You can see services sorted by the services. And um, if you click uh, on these items, you can uh, see uh, some solution text and instructions. I really recommend you to try these uh, packages from the RHEL 7 beta download, because uh, these are not yet available in the RHEL 6 uh, channels. Next item on my list is ABRT, the Automated Bug Reporting Tool. Uh, which um, analyzes uh, the system crashes for unusual situations. Uh, previously in C, C++, and Python, but uh, new version even in Ruby, Java, MCE. 
uh, new user interface uh, provides you uh, easier, even easier reporting. And there is one uh, feature I really would like to recommend you, uh, the retrace server. Uh, it is not enabled by, by default, but I recommend you to use it. Uh, it generates the micro reports and uh, sends uh, the data without uh, any sensitive information. Uh, it can be set up uh, mm, so the server is uh, in your infrastructure or it can send the data on, uh, uh, on the Red Hat server. And uh, based, uh, on, uh, based on this, we can prioritize the work. You can see the retrace server from, from Fedora and you can see that the GLIP networking uh, uh, bug uh, or crash, uh, which crashed Fedora uh, almost 400,000 uh, times, was fixed based on, the, uh, based on the retrace server. So you can prioritize your crashes based on the retrace server. And that's it. Uh, if you want to know more about the in-place upgrades, uh, uh, there is a session on Wednesday for 50 p.m. and we have three demo boot session, one uh, today evening and uh, two uh, sessions around noon uh, tomorrow. And software collections uh, right after this presentation, you can try at the 3.40 p.m. or 4.50 p.m. presentation about the software collections. Thanks. So hi there, I'm Karen Noel. Uh, my name Noel is like Christmas, so I'm gonna make fun of my name like Rashid did. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna talk about virtualization. So Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization is hypervisor is Red Hat's branded hypervisor technology based on KVM. It is the core hypervisor in Enterprise Linux OpenStack platform and Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization, or REV, and it's also used by Gluster, Red Hat Storage Server. KVM is also part of the Linux kernel. It is supported by RHEL. So that's what RHEL with KVM, and we have REV Hypervisor. In both cases, KVM is optimized for these products and, and use cases. So there's the KVM logo. We actually juggle these three components like Lars talked about mission critical, business processes, and systems of innovation. So uh, for mission critical, we have performance, scaling, rock solid security, and because we're part of RHEL, uh, stability. So business processes is like hardware abstraction and uh, integration with the Rev Hypervisor Manager. Systems of innovation, is our integration with OpenStack and Gluster and, and things like, and products from Red Hat like that. So uh, performance and scalability. Here's the charts showing the Specfert 2010 scores. Now Specfert 2010 has been retired. So these are the final results. There's a new Specfert 2013 benchmark now. And Red Hat with KVM, either Rev or Rel with KVM, claims 10 of the top 15 results. You can see where the, where the red bars, and that's either Rev or Rel with KVM. Red Hat also has the only eight and 16 socket results, so that you can see that we perform as well as scale. KVM supports the largest virtual machine of any of the hypervisors. We support 160 virtual CPUs, and up to 4,000 gigabytes of memory in a single VM. And new with RHEL 7, we support up to 32 assigned devices. So going on to security, um, we continue the tradition with SVIRT of um, security with SE Linux. But we have two new features coming in RHEL 7. The first one is sandboxing, and this is where um, QMU uses a new library called SecComp, and it can limit the number of syscalls that are made by QMU. And this helps isolate the virtual machine from the host and other virtual machines. The other feature for cryptography is a random number generator, para-virtualized random number generator in the guest. 
called vertio ring. And what this does is it gathers entropy from the host, which has a lot more entropy than each individual VM, and, and feeds that into the guests. And it can also take advantage of a hardware RNG device. So I want to talk about automatic NUMA balancing because KVM really takes advantage of this. Uh, as you can see in the picture, we have two NUMA nodes. We have a very simple example. You have two KVM virtual machines, each with just two virtual CPUs. In this case, everything is unbalanced. You have the virtual CPUs running on both NUMA nodes, and you have all the memory in one NUMA node, in node A. So in this case, everything has been balanced, and this is done in the kernel. So like Linda Wang talked about, um, she talked about the scheduler and the memory management changes that were made. Um, the kernel did this automatically for you. You get this feature out of the box, and KVM virtual machines can take, a, take advantage of this automatically. So the reason I'm presenting this in more detail is because this project was actually started several years ago by a KVM engineer working for Red Hat on my team. And he did all the proof of concept work. He worked upstream. He um, pushed it upstream. He engaged the memory management and scheduler communities. And he engaged Shaq's uh, performance team at Red Hat to get a really good working proof of concept. But as you may know, how the Linux kernel communities work is they don't always get along. And there was a lot of, lot of drama going on. So it really took, <laughs> it took a mediator from the KVM, KVM team, again, with a lot of kernel experience, that brought the memory management pieces upstream, working with, uh, in collaboration with other companies, even other distributions, to get the memory management pieces in first. And that was around the 3.8 kernel. And then later, he worked with the uh, scheduler community to get them to accept this, these concepts and figure out how to get this integrated into the kernel upstream. And that developer is here today, and he's um, going to be talking about automatic NUMA balancing with our partner from HP. So a couple of uh, more performance improvements that we've been working on for the RHEL 7 kernel and upstream. So we have several pair virtualized features that actually you can take advantage of automatically. All you have to do is run a RHEL 7 guest on a RHEL 7 host. These are things like pair virtualized ticket locks, pair virtualized page faults, uh, get time of day is a new virtual syscall. And as you may know, database applications just love to get the time of day over and over again, so now it's really fast. And pair virtualized end of interrupt is another one. We've been working with Intel, as you may have heard uh, earlier at the keynote, Intel and Red Hat, we work really closely together. They do the patches upstream. We are very active in the upstream community. We review the patches. And they're actually an on-site partner, and they help backport them to the patches to RHEL. So some of the new Intel fe features, APIC virtualization that you'll um, get with the new Ivy Bridge EX platform, uh, VTD large pages. So this is where you can put either 2 meg or 1 gig huge pages into the IOMMU for device assignment. And both of these give you um, really efficient TLB usage and IOTLB usage. We also cleaned up the um, one gig page support for KVM. So that's now uh, as fast as you can get with the low TLB usage. So both, yeah, I wish I had time to tell you about all the different features. Like, but everybody, just like everybody else, I have to skim through them all. So I want to mention that Network and SCSI now have multi-queue support for, for uh, greater throughput. There's also a new QCOW2 format with lazy ref counts that you can move up to the new format and get some more uh, performance improvements. Fertio block data plane, we talked about that last year. It was tech preview in RHEL 6. We got 1.5 million IOPS in a single virtual machine with data plane. So we're pushing that code upstream, but it wasn't quite ready for RHEL 7. So hopefully that'll be available in the next RHEL update. Um, Hyper-V Enlightenment, this is a really interesting one. What we do is we implemented um, Hyper-V pair virtualization features inside KVM. And so that Windows guests now are sort of tricked into thinking that they're running on Hyper-V. And I like to say this feature actually makes Windows guests run a lot more smoothly 
and, and faster. So virtualized storage. I had to pick one major feature to talk about. So I want to talk about thin provisioning. And the reason I chose this is you can see all the layers of storage that support thin provisioning. We've been working on this for years. So there at the top, there's uh, the format layer, QCOW2 and RAW both support it. Uh, the transport layer is files, block devices, Gluster and iSCSI. Gluster support is new in RHEL 6 and RHEL 7, and iSCSI is new for RHEL 7. The next layer down is the network, and these, these, this is the layer that supports the non-local storage. Then we have file systems, ext4 and xfs that support thin provisioning. And at the storage layer, the one I wanted to point out is uh, dmthinp for logical volume manager. So live migration is really exciting. We've done tons of work upstream. The whole community has to make live migration a lot better. But the exciting thing is you can do a live migration from rel6 to rel7. So your virtual machines running on a rel6 host can migrate with no downtime onto RHEL 7 and take advantage of some of these new features that we have in RHEL 7, such as automatic NUMA balancing. So there's a whole laundry list of um, improvements we've made to live migration. I don't have time to list them all, but the picture shows the new migration thread. Again, it makes live migration run smoother and faster. Okay, and the last feature is called VFIO, Virtual Function I.O. It's the new architecture for device, device assignment. So in RHEL 6, you had PCI device, uh, device assignment. Now in RHEL 7, you have VFIO. What we did is we split the de de device assignment uh, function out of KVM and into its own module in the kernel. So it could be used by any user space driver. And QMU is a user space driver so that it can assign devices to the guests. Um, it uses hardware features so that it creates better isolation between the guests. So the hardware will tell, will tell us which functions have better isolation. And the exciting new thing is VFIO was going so well that we decided to try GPU virtual uh, GPU device assignment with NVIDIA, and that's all working, supported in RHEL 7 with the grid and quadro cards. So because I'm out of time, I'll just point out that we have demos and presentations, and remember that KVM is the core hypervisor in RHEL OSP and in REV, so if you see any uh, presentations and demos with those technologies in it, you know that KVM is, is in there. Okay, thank you. All right, can you guys hear me? All right, I'm Paul Frields. Uh, I'm the Fedora Engineering Manager, but I get to talk to you uh, about some work that I'm very proud of that my colleagues on the desktop engineering team have done. Um, a lot of my other friends and colleagues from the department talk to you about scalability, about performance, um, about all of those you know, vital factors uh, that are in the data center. I'm going to talk to you about something that's a little different. Um, beauty, elegance, simplicity, um, some of the work that, uh, that our folks have been doing through the GNOME project for some time now and I think really has culminated in, in RHEL 7. Um, how many of you are using or managing uh, Linux on the desktop in your environment? All right, quite a few. Yeah, so this is going to be important to you just as, uh, just as much then. So um, in, the, uh, in the RHEL 7 release candidate, when you guys get a hold of that next week, um, you're going to see the new GNOME 3 based interface. So this is, uh, it's actually the result of many, uh, many years of development work. And uh, you're going to find that although the, uh, the underlying uh, strata of GNOME 3 are all there and you're going to get a lot of the power uh, and the new, uh, the new facilities that are part of GNOME 3. Um, we've also tried to pay attention to the fact that not every customer is necessarily going to be ready for the new interface. So we provided what's called a classic mode, which is a default. It's a familiar interface over top of GNOME 3. So it gives you a lot of the things that you're, that you're used to seeing uh, in RHEL 5 and 6. And you'll see them on these slides. So I've used the desktop to sort of form my environment um, for these slides. So you'll see things like the main menu, you'll see a window list, you'll see desktop icons. Um, however, the GNOME 3 standard mode is also available to you, so when you're ready to take the leap, you can use that as well. Um, we also, of course, provide KDE. 
uh, um, for those customers who are, are used to that as well. Um, the extensibility and flexibility of GNOME 3 is really amazing. And one of the reasons we're able to provide this classic mode is simply because of the extensibility of GNOME 3. What you're seeing is, uh, essentially here is a set of extensions that are managed on top of GNOME 3 to give you these other features. All right, so um, one of the other new tools I'm going to talk to you about is GNOME Boxes. So with Boxes in RHEL 7, um, developers and novices can have a good experience when they want to spin up KVM virtual machines. So it's designed for ease of use, and it hides the typical complexities of working with virtualization. So the tool makes it easier to do development and testing on the desktop without privileged access to the hypervisor. But it is, again, still KVM underneath. So all the work that Karen's team has done to bring you uh, KVM features can be accessed through boxes. You can simply point boxes at an, I at an ISO file, adjust the memory and disk size as needed, and go. Um, it even has some intelligence about guest agents and the operating systems that it's loading, so it saves you some steps. Um, RHEL 7 also integrates online account services. Uh, multiple providers are available, and you can select these accounts when you first log into a desktop session. So those of you who work in, uh, in enterprise environments will appreciate the fact that uh, Kerberos is, is, uh, uh, is integrated into the online accounts. Um, also, uh, Exchange services, so you can load up your Microsoft Exchange server as well. Um, but that's not, that's not all. There's also online account services, uh, online account services for some of the popular uh, web services available, uh, things like, like Google and Facebook and OwnCloud. Um, and those, are, those actually spread across the desktop uh, into your functions like chat and document searching. So there's a lot of integration work that's gone into that. Some other features and enhancements include iBus, which is a, a new input method framework, and it allows for a seamless experience for users in non-English languages. Um, those of you or customers who are working in design or working in creative are going to appreciate that there's improved support for Wacom tablet devices. We actually believe that configuration of tablet inputs in RHEL 7 actually exceeds any other operating system at, that, at, at this point. It's actually better and easier than any other OS. Um, we also have accessibility improvements in RHEL 7, like an, uh, an improved on-screen keyboard, one-click visual enhancements like high contrast and zoom for people who have visual impairments. Also, there are audio enhancements as well. And all of these can be switched on in the shell and immediately, uh, and immediately take effect. Um, in RHEL 5 and 6, that framework didn't exist, and you actually had to restart your session, so it was a bit cumbersome. And now those things can actually be enabled and disabled on the fly. So Red Hat has participated in a lot of upstreams, not just GNOME, which I've been talking about, but um, other upstreams as well to improve applications across the desktop. And so um, of the applications that have substantial improvements, this includes the Evolution uh, Personal Information Suite. Um, there's now improved integration for client use on your Microsoft Exchange servers. Those of you who are also using uh, the open source Zimbra collaboration server will also find some improvements there in Evolution as well. Um, so Evolution continues to, uh, to improve. Other application enhancements include LibreOffice 4.1. Um, with 4.1, we've got better compatibility with Microsoft Office documents, and that includes Visio and being able to import Microsoft Publisher documents. And this is all work that, that Red Hat is actually participating in the upstream LibreOffice uh, uh, community. Um, also, for those of you who are uh, Google Chrome users, you guys will be happy to know that Chrome works just fine on RHEL 7 out of the box. Um, but eventually, because of the development and deployment model that Google uses, where they push out um, very rapid change and, and improvements into uh, Chrome constantly, um, it may become, uh, it, 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 it may actually be become the case that Google Chrome is not going to work out of the box on RHEL 7 anymore. Um, however, like we've done for RHEL 6, um, Red Hat is uh, committed to provide a build of the open source Chromium browser, um, and that way you'll be able to continue to use those plugins and those apps that you use in Chrome um, on RHEL 7 uh, for, uh, for its lifetime. 
Now, if you're interested in learning more about the desktop, you can attend a lab, uh, which is happening Thursday morning, uh, which allows you to actually play around with RHEL 7. I would encourage any of you who have not to uh, check out the beta, which you can download through the customer portal, or even better, if you wait till next week, you'll be able to grab a, a copy of the release candidate and try it out. Or you can see my friends at the Fedora booth, uh, who will provide you with a live USB key where you can run a, uh, a new GNOME release. It's only slightly newer than what we have in RHEL 7, um, and you can play around with the features there. Um, also, uh, my, my friend and colleague, Matthias Klausen, who is a real expert in all things desktop and all things GNOME, um, will be at the platform booth uh, in the partner pavilion. He'll be demoing uh, the GNOME desktop for you uh, this evening um, during the partner reception and also uh, on Wednesday morning. And also, you can read uh, about desktop changes and administration in our uh, migration and administration guide, which is available on the customer portal. Um, and the last thing I wanted to let you know is, um, is that all of this work is being driven upstream in the GNOME community. So you can visit them at any time at gnome.org. Uh, and you can see all the, the work and community that we've been uh, helping to build there, uh, along with our collaborators upstream. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend David Cantrell. Can you hear me? OK. My name is David Cantrell, and I'm the manager of the installer engineering team at Red Hat. Um, when I say the installer, uh, sometimes I get questions where people say, is that like Anaconda? It is Anaconda. It's the same thing. Um, so just to clarify that for those who have asked. Before I continue, uh, I do want to mention our demo sessions. We have one this evening from 6.30 to 7.30. Uh, in the infrastructure area in the Red Hat booth. And then tomorrow morning from 10 to noon, we'll also be demoing the installer. So if you have questions, uh, you know, specific details you want to know or, or specific questions you want to ask, please stop by and, you know, we're happy to talk. So a show of hands, how many people have installed the 7.0 beta? I'm, I'm curious. Okay, that's good. So I've heard from a lot of people that they install it and they say, wow, you know, a lot has changed. There, there has been a lot of work that has gone into this. This doesn't look like any RHEL release I've, I've ever seen before. Um, it, it's true. We did change quite a bit. And it starts with installation. I consider myself pretty lucky because nearly every manager before me mentioned something that we integrated into the installer uh, for RHEL 7. Um, and th it's true. We, we are the piece of software that forms that first opinion. And we also expose so many of the things you've already heard about. Uh, some things have UI elements that only get exposed in install time. So it's really critical for us to do that correctly. When we sat down to do RHEL 7, we started asking questions like, how do people actually use it out there in the world? How are our customers using RHEL? in the enterprise, in the data center, on the desktop, things like that. And we started getting really good feedback from customers. We were able to you know, condense that down and, and identify key use cases that helped us form our goals. So for RHEL 7, we wanted to have a consistent user experience across all of RHEL. That's been kind of our guiding design principle for everything that we do. We want it to look like one seamless product. Uh, if you look at RHEL 6, it, it looks kind of that way, even RHEL 5. But you know you can tell that it's different pieces of software. So we wanted to take advantage of a lot of the new technologies that you're hearing about, like with GNOME 3, things like SystemD, and, and other tools like that. So with RHEL 7, we have a new GTK3 based user interface. We have a new text mode interface. We have a new storage configuration interface and a first boot replacement. But to call any fear, Kickstart is the same. Uh, that is the second most common question I get. What have you changed in Kickstart? We're very conservative when it comes to Kickstart changes because we know so many people rely on it not changing. We do introduce new commands, though. So, you know. uh, so going back to the goals, what, what did we want to accomplish besides a seamless user experience? Well, we wanted to hit those use cases of how people are using it. So for the desktop users and for the developers out there who are working on a web app or some kind of tool and they need to use RHEL, these are the users that may or may not do their own installation, and they don't want to spend a lot of time in the installer. 
So we were able to take advantage of a lot of the GNOME 3 UI technology to make the graphical installer a lot faster. It's multi-threaded now. When you fire it up, you probably saw this in the beta. It started doing things on the screen. It was trying to answer a lot of questions before you even were presented with a question. If it was able to get a network uh, connection, it started figuring out where you were using GeoIP. These are all things that we were able to take advantage of with uh, the other technologies in RHEL 7. The text mode interface, I don't have a screenshot of it because, well, it's text mode. But one thing that we heard from our uh, enterprise customers in the data center is that the existing curses-based interface did not work well in a lot of their serial console environments or like power hardware environments, very specific use cases. So we wanted to improve that for people too. So our text mode interface took that into account. So the new text mode interface it, it looks like, well, a, a text-based version of the graphical one, but it's designed so that it works well on serial consoles, and it also runs inside TMUX, so you get a terminal multiplexer if you're on a serial console, which is, we've heard, quite helpful for people. New storage configuration, this I could talk forever on, and I urge you to come by the demo booths uh, so that we can show you uh, the detail there. The high-level idea is that you no longer have to be a kernel developer to understand how to do custom partitioning. We focus storage configuration on the installer on mount points, file systems. You know you want root, you know you want home, you know you want boot. Define those, define the size, then you, you define the technology that implements that underneath. The first boot replacement, which we call initial setup, uh, it, it shares a name similar with the, the GNOME tool, uh, which is initial user, I, I forget. Um, this is plug-in oriented, much like the uh, first boot that you see in RHEL 6 and prior. But we've extended that plug-in capability so that plugins written for initial setup can also be made available in the, in the installer. So we, we had some requests from customers to be able to extend the installer with site-specific uh, requirements, things like that. So we have this plugin architecture that, that works across that. And you can also, uh, that plugin can extend Kickstart as well. So you can add your own Kickstart commands. Um, okay. <clears throat> as I said, automatic default answers when possible. You've probably heard the term hub and spoke layout. This is kind of our uh, description for how the installer works now, where it's not the linear uh, question and answer with the next and back buttons. You can answer these questions in the order that works well for you. Defaults are presented on the main screen. And then you proceed to the next stage, which is actually doing the, the uh, file system layout, storage allocation, package installation, all of that. Text mode, as I indicated, is better suited to serial consoles and limited display interfaces. Um, Jack mentioned that we have the Active Directory host enrollment uh, enabled, and we do have that that we're demoing uh, in the booth. So if you have questions about that. And the plugin architecture that I was talking about, we, um, we have a lot of uh, documentation on this. If you have questions about it, please ask. Now, storage features. I, I, I really wanted to re restrict myself because I, I, can, I can go on forever about it. So automatic partitioning in Anaconda, this has been a, a functionality that's been present really since the beginning of, of Anaconda in Red Hat's Linux product. Uh, we extended it uh, to allow users to pick other storage layout modes. We've, we've always defaulted to LVM, basically. Uh, you can now choose automatic partitioning and pick LVM. You can pick LVM with thin provisioning. You can pick ButterFS. Or the second most popular right now is just picking standard partitions, people that don't want LVM. And you can take advantage of that automatic layout capability in Anaconda. Detailed control over preserving and resizing existing volumes. And this, is, this is best for a demo, honestly. Uh, we, we have we have a lot more control over <sighs> explaining to you what is going to happen during installation. So we model all of that storage layout at install time and allow you to set all of the details before committing it to disk. Custom configuration presented in a top-down model. This is where I was saying you don't have to be a kernel developer or storage expert to know how to set up your RHEL system. Now this last one is not, um, 
it's not something that we've talked about a lot, but I think people will find it quite useful. There were instances in the past in RHEL 6 and RHEL 5 where people needed to do something specific in their, their environment to configure storage. Maybe they needed to run some kind of vendor command or thing like that, and they needed to do that. They had to exit the installer and then go back in, and it, it, was, it was kind of clumsy. They had to figure out how to do that using Kickstart or something like that. What we've added in Anaconda is the ability to discover storage changes on the system while you're still running Anaconda. So if you find yourself in that situation, you can go over to TTY2, you can make your changes on the system, come back, and then you can rescan, and we will discover what you did on the system. So it helps fill that need uh, of handling the very specific use cases. I mentioned the, uh, these sessions up front uh, just because I thought I would run out of time. Um, and the, these links down here are, uh, that's our, the Fedora Project Wiki page. That's our main community development site. We do all of our work in Fedora, as uh, Denise pointed out earlier. And the second link there, the blog link, is sort of a recap of our uh, history of going through this, this UI overhaul to meet all of the needs that uh, the, the goals that we had and the, the customer use cases that were presented to us. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to Matt. Okay, hi everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah good. Uh, so my name is Matt Newsom. I'm one of the engineering managers for the tools team at Red Hat. Um, very often with talks like this, maybe start off with a joke. So I said to my colleagues here, should I say something funny? They said, Matt, you're from London, England. Everything you say sounds funny. <laughs> All right. So you've heard from these, uh, these managers about some of the great new features that we have coming down the line in RHEL 7 and what we have today in RHEL 6. And it's my pleasure to continue that by talking to you about some of the features that we have specifically for RHEL developers. All right. So let's start with Java. You know, Red Hat is a major contributor to the OpenJDK project, and we have OpenJDKs 6 and 7 in RHEL. And last year, when Oracle declared OpenJDK 6 end of life, Red Hat assumed responsibility for OpenJDK 6 in the upstream, and you'll continue to find support for OpenJDK 6 in RHEL from Red Hat. Alongside that, we have support for a number of the uh, proprietary JDKs. They're available too. So we have Oracle, Java 6, and 7, and IBM Java's 5, 6, and 7. Now, complementing the, uh, the JDKs, uh, you know, coming down the line in RHEL 7, we have a new tool called Thermostat. It's a powerful new profiling and monitoring tool for open JDK 7 and higher. And that's going to be made available through Red Hat Software Collections, which Andre talked to us through earlier on. Further down the line, we're looking at open JDK 8, and also the ultra-low pause time Shenandoah garbage collector which is really suitable for uh, very large heaps of 100 gigabytes or higher. All right. So actually, uh, Thermostat complements uh, the, you know, we already have a, a suite of performance analysis tools in RHEL 6 today. So just to quickly run through which, uh, which ones we have, we've got SystemTap, which is our live application analysis tool, doesn't require rebuilding your application. In RHEL 6.5, we've got a number of documentation and performance improvements, but we're also adding new language support. So we've got regular expression operators, macros, and support for reading hardware performance counters. Next up, PAPI, or PAPI. That's our interface to actually uh, monitor that performance counter hardware. RHEL 6.5 adds support for Ivy Bridge and Sandy Bridge. OProfile is our unobtrusive system-wide code profiler. And we have Valgrind, and I'm told it said Valgrind, or Valgrind, or whatever. Um, and that's for runtime analysis, particularly for finding memory leaks in your applications. So that rounds out the set. Now, in RHEL 7, we're both updating a number of these components and also adding some new ones. So Dynast is new in RHEL. It's a library for manipulating live executables. And SystemTap has been updated so that you can run SystemTap scripts via Dynast, and so you don't need kernel privileges anymore. You've got a pure user land mode. We're planning to introduce Performance Copilot. So this is a library and toolkit uh, for gathering performance measurements from applications, servers, and networks, and then uh, visualizing and responding to those. 
And a number of these tools and libraries integrate really nicely as well. So for example, you could take uh, a performance analysis that you've done with SystemTap, which is using Dynast. You can then feed that into PCP, and PCP has its own visualizer GUI, and so you can see the results. And finally, in, in RHEL 7, we're looking to update uh, Valgrind and also Elf Utils, which is our tool for manipulating and analyzing Elf binaries. So we really are passing along the, the latest and greatest tools that we can to you as developers. Now, I'm, I'm responsible for the compiler that goes in, in Fedora and RHEL. Uh, when we put a version of GCC into RHEL, we stand behind that with a service level agreement for up to 10 years. And so we ensure that you get the, uh, the support that you need for your, uh, for your application. We can see this, the way we achieve that actually is by fixing to one major version of these components in RHEL, which we then stay with for the duration. So you can see this today in action in RHEL 5 and 6. We've got GCC 4.1, GDB 7.0, and GLibc 2.5 in RHEL 5. And as mentioned earlier, RHEL 5 is very much in a, in a kind of conservative um, stability focus right now. When RHEL 6 came out, we had GCC 4.4, which we actually added back into RHEL 5 so you could transition your code across. And we had GDB 7.2 and GLibc 2.12. Um, we do pass along a number of performance-focused updates, but we also uh, make sure that we retain the enterprise class stability that we know you guys rely on. So that's 5 and 6. In 7 release candidate, uh, we are updating those components to major new releases. So we have uh, GCC 4.8, GDB 7.6 and GLibc 2.17. And just to pull out some of the quick headlines on GCC, what, you know, what do I get as a developer? So you get C++ 11 and Dwarf 4 standard support. You're getting guaranteed atomic uh, accesses to memory, so you can have a variable and you can use that to synchronize across threads. You're getting transactional memory, where you can have a group of instructions uh, and you can have them act as similar to a database transaction. So all of their effects on memory either happen completely as a group or they roll back and none of it happens. GCC actually had a 25-year-old register allocator, which we've replaced. Uh, it was a Red Hat engineer in my team who has contributed that code. Uh, and so that's resulted in extensive performance improvements for you. And finally, we have built-in detectors for memory errors and data races. So some great new features. Now, complementing the, um, the core tools in RHEL itself, and I should emphasize that we actually use G the GCC and base RHEL to build RHEL, but we also include it for you to use. We have developer toolset, and a quick show of hands, who actually has heard of developer toolset before? Okay, good number. So developer toolset um, is a parallel set of the latest stable tools from upstream, provided as non-default, so you have to choose to use them, uh, but provided by the software collection framework, which Andre again was talking us through earlier on. It's updated on an annual cadence and is available to uh, our subscribers with a developer subscription, among some other ways. Uh, last month, we released version 2.1, and that supports C, C++, Fortran, x86, and x86.64. Now, you'll note that a number of the versions of the tools that we have in developer toolset are very similar to the versions I was just talking about for RHEL. So we have GCC 4.8, GDB 7.6, We've updated those uh, performance tools. So what's the difference? Why would we do that? Well, actually, these tools are available to users on RHEL 5 and 6. So you can get access to the same tools, essentially, uh, on early releases of RHEL, build applications, and then we support execution of those applications on two major releases of RHEL. So you can build on uh, RHEL 5 and execute on RHEL 6. And similarly, we are saying today that uh, if you build with developer tool sets, GCC on RHEL 6, uh, you can test that on the release candidate. When the GA comes along, you'll be able to deploy to that platform. And finally, the uh, Eclipse Integrated Development Environment, the IDE, has actually been moved out of RHEL into developer toolset to better match the cadence of updates that we see upstream. And that will continue to be the case going forwards. All right. I'll be doing a couple of demos over the, uh, well, tomorrow, on the uh, demo floor. So we've got 9.15 AM and then again at 1 PM at the, uh, the Red Hat booth, if you'd like to come along and see developer toolset, I can show you a demo, talk you through it, show maybe something that's specific to your use case. Uh, I'm then doing a, uh, a longer talk, a deeper dive tomorrow in room 236 as part of the Taste of DevNation track. And I should emphasize, you don't need to be a DevNation badge holder or attendee uh, to be able to get into that. Anyone who's come to Summit can get into that track. I encourage you to come along and see a demo as well there. 
uh, for more information on performance tools. So Will Cohen is another a colleague of mine from the tools team, uh, always has a, a very well attended and received talk on performance, uh, finding common performance issues. And Will's actually doing that talk in room 208 in about an hour's time from now. And then finally, for you know, generally uh, general updates on our developer program, we have developerblog.redhat.com, and I encourage you to go and have a look there. And with that, I will pass back to Denise. Thank you, everyone. So, just to wrap this up, RHEL 7.0, release candidate next week. Yes. <laughs> yes, watch for the release candidate, pick it up, try it out, see what you think. I, I'm, really, I'm really thrilled that you know, we're open enough that you're going to get a release candidate, right? You can't do much more of a beta update than that. Um, RHEL 7 is designed as a solid base for an application-optimized infrastructure. And it's coming to you from the RHEL platform team leading responsible, innovative communities everywhere. So thank you for joining us today. And thank you very much for running RHEL. We'll see you. Enjoy the summit. Come talk with us. Come see the demos. Fill out, um, fill out the forms uh, on, the, on the survey app. And please check out the blog. Lots of information. Thank you very much, everybody.